You know, the word thanksgiving, maybe it's because I'm French, but I like to, I see two words here. I see thanks and I see giving. It makes me think of the importance of giving thanks. And it's a reminder of the importance of gratitude or giving of thanks. Uh, we, we give gratitude to those around us that are special to us. Gratitude to those who bless us in one way or another all year long. Maybe your parents, your mom, your dad, maybe your spouse, or maybe your frontline workers who are going above what is expected of them, over and above. And I want to encourage you today, this weekend, to find someone that really truly blesses you and just let them know. Maybe that person's not in your physical circle, but maybe send them a note, call them, do a little Zoom, Skype. I encourage you to find someone that truly blesses you and just let them know, you bless me. I'm blessed to have you as a friend. I'm blessed to have you as a family member. And just thank them. Today, however, I do want to talk about giving thanks, but I, I want to specifically talk about giving thanks to God. Um, there are, as you know, there are different ways to say thank you. And um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to ask you to, we're going to turn up many verses today, so a lot of verses won't pop up here. Some of them will, but not all of them. Luke 17, verse 11, if you don't have your Bible, you could jot down the, the reference, so you could go back to it. In Luke 17, we find 10 lepers, and back in those days, um, uh, lepers were, if you, were, you had leprosy, you were quarantined. Not two weeks, but forever, all right? Uh, you, were, you were kind of put aside, and every time somebody saw you, they would yell out to protect everybody. They would yell out, impure, impure, impure. You know, you didn't have an app back in those days that would notify you that this person has leprosy. And so they would yell it, and you would feel really, really small. But um, everything was about to change for these 10 lepers. Their moment was about to happen. And all of the things that they couldn't do, now they would be able to do so. They were about to go from, I can't, to I can. This disease that affected every area of their life, this disease that kept them isolated, rejected, and away from everyone, on lockdown, lonely, would now be removed. And the reason is simple. Jesus happened. How many know that when Jesus happened, things happened? Things that you couldn't do, now you can do. Things that you were not allowed to do, now you can do. With purpose. And so now they would be experiencing their moment. So Luke 17, verse 11. Now Jesus on his way to Jerusalem traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. See, they were practicing social distancing even back in those days. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, back in those days, uh, the priest function had, they, they had, the priests had many functions. And so if you had leprosy, um, and some, somehow you got miraculously healed, you had to go present yourself to the priest so he could check and confirm and certify that you have been healed, that you have been cleansed from that leprosy. And so he would sign it off. And so Jesus is actually, he's, he's actually saying, go show yourself to the priest. And on their way to go see the priest, on their way to obeying what Jesus asked them to do, on their way to do what Jesus prescribed them to do, they were healed. And uh, verse 15 now tells us one of them. Everybody say one of them. How many of them went out? Ten. But one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. What did he do when he came back? 
He came back praising God in a loud voice. Everybody say a loud voice. All right, no, say a loud voice loudly. Loud voice. That's too loud. You guys are hurting my ear. Uh, <clears throat> he came back, praised God in a, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. A Samaritan was not a pure Jew. This was considered a compromised Jew, somebody who kind of doesn't uh, fit in our Jewish club. They're kind of an outsider. Verse 17, Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed or healed? Or where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner or this non-Jewish person? When he said to him, rise, uh, then he said to him, rise and go, your fate has made you well. What a powerful miracle that took place for all 10 of these lepers, except only one came back to say thank you. Only one came back to praise God because of what he noticed in his life. Is it possible that Jesus accomplishes so many great things in our life and only one out of ten will say thank you? Is it possible that we as believers sometimes, we, we kind of take for granted some things that Jesus do and we forget to say one out of ten times, we forgot to say thank you? Where are the other nine? How can that be? How, how great is our God? He changed your life. He forgave you for so much. He died on the cross so that you could enjoy eternal life and enjoy forgiveness. He has provided for you. He has protected you. He has healed you. Whatever he has done for you. And we forgot, we didn't bother or we forgot to say thank you. Did you know that saying thank you is not just a Canadian thing or a cultural thing or a respectful thing or even a polite thing to do. Did you know that saying thank you is actually a command in the Word of God? Saying thank you is part of God's will for our life, to develop and cultivate an attitude of gratitude. You guys are looking at me like you're like, yeah, right. I'll prove it to you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks. Everybody say give thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is what? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, the will of God for you is to be thankful. It's to thank God in all circumstances. It is the will of God. It is his command for us for his children to live and practice and develop a thanksgiving spirit, an attitude of gratitude. And so for the remaining of our time together, I think we got like four or five hours left. Uh, <clears throat> so for the remaining of our time today, I'd like to propose to you five ways, five ways to thank God, five ways to practice thanksgiving uh, to God, not only on Thanksgiving, but all throughout our lives. Amen? So if you're jotting some notes down, the first way is obvious. The first way we can say thank you to Jesus is by saying it. Say it. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. This man was vocal about his gratitude. He was loud about it. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. When is the last time you and I said to thank you to Jesus? Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness. Thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, for all the things you did, for all the things you're doing, and for all the things you have in store. Say it. Say it to him. Start your morning. Let's not just limit our thanksgiving to the meal we're about to eat. Let's not just say thank you before we go to bed. Let's say, let's develop an attitude of gratitude. Throughout the day, all day, I've made a discipline to start my request in prayer by thanking him before I start asking him. This man was saying it to God. This man was saying it as well to others. So we say it to God, but we say it to others as well. He was so loud that other people heard him. 
There's nothing wrong with us saying to others, man, I'm so grateful to God for what he's doing in my life. I'm so thankful for what he's done in my life. Let's not be shy about telling others why we're grateful to God of what he's doing in our life. In Psalm 717, it says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart, and I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. It's not about showing off. It's about showing him off and showing off of what he's doing. Amen? You know, normally at this time of year, we have what we call a an open mic service where we would have the mic open for members of the congregation to grab the mic and share with others what they're grateful to God for what he's doing in their life. And obviously the whole COVID-19 happened, so we won't be doing that. But I encourage you to do that at home, to share that. Maybe before you have your meal today in your family, maybe your close family, just take a moment around the table and share what God has done in your family this year, what you're grateful for, if you could do that. But say it. Say it to God. Say it to others. And say it to yourself. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Some of us need to be reminded that whatever good things happen in our life or that we have in our life came from Him. Psalm 103.2 says, Bless the Lord. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to a big crowd on the concert stage? Bless the Lord. You know who David is talking to? Himself. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Say to God, say to others, and say it to yourself. Soul, be thankful to God. Soul, bless the Lord. Soul, forget not all his benefits benefits. Amen? And so that's one way we could thank the Lord, is by saying it, being verbal, vocal about it. Second way, another way to do it is by showing it. Uh, This man shows us or shows Jesus that he's very thankful by throwing himself at his feet. He's so merciful, he's so grateful, grateful of what he received Uh, the the healing from Jesus that he falls on his face before the feet of Jesus and he's showing it by an act of devotion. He recognized that the great gift he just received, his life was now going to change forever and he just showed it by throwing himself, showing devotion to Jesus. Who else in the New Testament has been showing that she was grateful for what Jesus has done in her life and showed it by an act of devotion? Mary, you remember Mary. Mary had been caught in an act of adultery and the law required that you would stone such a person. And so these religious Pharisees are grabbing their rocks and they're about to throw stone at her and they see Jesus and they they ask Jesus what he would do about this. What would you do about that, Rabbi? And Jesus, this is where the famous uh, drawing the land in the sand and There's a pause, and then he goes and he says, Let he who never sinned throw the first, cast the first stone. And they all left. And he turned to this lady and said, See, your condemners are gone, and I do not condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Later on, we find him in the house of a Pharisee that invited him. And what is she doing? She's not caring about the crowd. She's not caring about who's at the, the house. She's at Jesus' feet, washing his feet with her tears and and drying his feet with her hair. And she pours an expensive perfume on him as an act of gratitude, as an act of devotion. She was showing to Jesus that she was grateful. Sometimes one of the best ways you could show Jesus that you're thankful is by showing it. You You show it. By your actions, you show it by devotion. You show it with your life. We offer to God a sacrifice of praise with our lives. Thirdly, how do we say thank you to God? By singing it. We sang it today. We sang thank you to the Lord. We sing. We, we show thank you. To, we, we say thank you to God by singing praise to Him. 
You know, this man who used to be a leper came, came back, and one of the first things it says he did, he came back praising God in a loud voice, for he was healed and he was cleansed. Singing is a great way to say thank you to Jesus. Listen to Psalm 100, beginning of verse 1. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let's say it all together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. You know, when I was young, I went to a church. It was, a, it was not a church that we attended. It was just a church we showed up there once a year at Christmas. And I remember when we were there, we were young kids, and everybody was looking at us, and they were like, shh, silence. And uh, I guess they were afraid of us kids making a lot of noise because we were kind of hyper. But, uh, but the people attending at that church regularly, you could see that they were all like whispering in the service. Uh, throughout the whole time, and I remembered that, and it kind of just, it, it's something I didn't, forget, I, I didn't forget, and I wonder what a verse like this would do to them, a verse that says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I wonder uh, what, what a man entering their church sanctuary, shouting and praising God because he's been healed, what it would do to them. I, and I asked myself, if I was part of that, would it make us uncomfortable? Would we feel embarrassed? Would we be embarrassed of him? Yes, the Bible calls us to approach God with reverence, seriousness, and respect. But it also calls us to approach him with thanksgiving. The Bible also calls us to have divine order, have order in our service. So shouting and, 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 and you know, praising during the sermon is probably not the best time. Uh, you know, there's order. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we worship and praise, friends, let's not be timid. Let's not be shy. Let's not be afraid uh, because we have so much to be thankful for. For God has done so, so much. How many of you, God has done so, so much? All right, two of you. How many of you, God has done so, so much? Amen. You know, people are not conservative, introverts or timid or shy or afraid when their favorite team puts a puck in a net, when their favorite team won the Super Bowl. They don't care what they look like when they're shouting on the benches. And they're almost on the other person's bench. But when it comes to God's people, sometimes I feel like people are, no, no. Keep it to ourself. Not too, not too charismatic. Look at these guys, bunch of yahoos. Just keep reverence. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. For he has done, he has done so much. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his, pre his presence with singing. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let me say that again. This is good. Enter his gates with with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen? Amen. I, I could keep going in the Psalms. 95 2 says, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. The way we are to approach God's presence is with thanksgiving. Psalm 147, verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre so we could do it with instruments. Amen. Psalm 28, verse 7, last verse for this point. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts. And with, with what? With my song, I give thanks to him. One of the ways we could give thanks to God and show him that we, we are grateful and say thank you to God is by singing, by praising with our lips and being vocal 
about it. Amen? Number four, how do we say thank you to God? By serving him. So by saying it, by showing it, by singing it, by serving him. I apologize in advance if we're going to camp on this one longer than the other ones, but as I was preparing this message, I, I felt like I was anchored on this point. And it was as if God was telling me to make sure that this point is crystal clear. Make sure there's no confusion on this one. Elaborate. And it's not because this one's more important than the others. It's because this one, there's so much confusion around it. A lot of people have a bad understanding or maybe bad theology about this one, which is serving God. Part of the problem is the way people prioritize their life. The common way Christians prioritize their, their life is by saying, well, God is first in my life. Family is second. And when we say family is second, it's husband, wife, it's marriage, it's parenting, it's gardening, it's soccer practice, it's hockey games, it's all the good stuff. And, and then the third, we say, well, the third priority now is serving. The third priority is, is um, ministry. It's, 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 it's um, serving in some capacity. And I agree that God it needs to be first. That we should have God at the forefront of our life. That we are to love God with all our heart. He needs to come first in our life. Anything that comes first in our life, the Bible considers it as an idol. And so God has to be the number one priority in our life, no matter who you are. You could have the office of a prime minister of a country, and yet God needs to be first in your life. You could be a guy working at a gas station, and still God needs to be first in your life. This, this is for everyone. We are to put him first. We have been created to worship him, to serve him, to love him. We're part of his family. He needs to be first. And secondly, family is important. We need to cherish, treasure. Family is a gift from God. And we need to value and cherish our families. But here's the mistake a lot of us make. Is they put service or serving God or ministry... Third, and that's a serious mistake. Because serving God should never be third or fourth or even second. It should be first. Why? Because serving God is part of worshiping God. Serving God is part of obeying God. Serving God is, is part of being faithful to the God-given gifts he's put in our lives. Serving God is being a good steward of what he's invested in us to give back to the church, give back to the body of Christ. The, body, the Bible calls the church many names. One of the terms it uses is uh, the body of Christ. And so every member that given their life to Christ are part of the church or part of the family of Christ. And so some of you are an arm. Others are a leg. I'm obviously a mouth. And uh, some of you are ears. And you get the metaphor here. Every member of that church is part of the body of Christ, his body. But if the arm says, I don't have time to serve, guess what happens? The body is crippled. The body is not op operating to full capacity. The body becomes sick and sometimes handicapped. What if a leg says, ah, I'm going to stay home and do my own thing. and I just got a relationship with God. I don't need the church. We're going to have to push the church in a wheelchair. Are you getting the drift here? So God first, yes. Family second, of course. But serving God third, absolutely not. Because serving God is part of loving God. Serving God is part of worshiping God. Serving God is part of doing what he's planted us on earth to do. And so it needs to be at the top priority. And that's a great way to say thank you to God, is by serving him. You know, in fact, the Bible encourages us to serve God with our families. It's not, you know, I'm going to serve God, leave my family at home. If you have a chance, an opportunity to do, there's many families, that's what you do. You serve as a family. If you have the, the, the luxury of doing that in the 
privilege of doing it. That's so great. We are to train our children to serve the Lord at a young age. I'm, I'm super blessed that they asked my son to help this morning to serve uh, because that's, that's the joy of our father. We want our sons and our daughters to serve the Lord. We want to say like Joshua said, me and my house shall serve the Lord. You know, another reason why this is important to talk about service and why service needs to be at the forefront. And we'll talk more about this one day, I'm sure. But did you know that one day, we will all, and when I say all, it means everybody, we will all give an account for our lives, all of us. We will be judged for our service, judged for our works. There are many different judgments in the Bible you could read about, but two that are important for us today, and that is there's two forms of judgments. There's one called the judgment seats of Christ, and then the other one is called the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is for people who rejected Christ. That judgment is reserved for those who said, I heard Jesus died on the cross for the sins of people. I think that's great, but that's not for me. I heard that if I give my life to Jesus and I receive him as my Savior, I, I will be forgiven my sins, but I don't need him. I think church is for people with crutches and grandmas. But it's not for me. I got my own thing. And if you're a grandma here, God bless you. I'm not disrespecting you at all. And if you have crutches, don't be, oh my goodness, I'm burying myself. <laughs> but this judgment is for those who did not allow Jesus to rang in their lives. They said, it's my way or the highway, but it's definitely not God's way. It's a final judgment for unbelievers that we read about in Revelation 20. In verse 11, it says, John says, I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the, heaven, the, earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. And then a book was open, which, which is the book of life. The, de the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up their dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave, gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. The, then death and Hades were thrown, thrown in the lake of fire, the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire, a.k.a. hell. Now, if you wake up one day and you see the great white throne judgment, it's a nightmare that will never end. And you don't want that judgment. In fact, let me say it this way. God doesn't want you to go through that judgment. That is why God is not coming back yet. That is why he didn't pull the plug on the world yet. That is why the rapture has not come. It's because Jesus is still patient. God is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants as many people as possible to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ and receive the gift that was given out of love and grace for people to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior so they could experience this unmerited grace. God desires none to perish. Eternal separation from God was not designated for people. It was designated for the devil and the fallen angels. But God is also a gentleman. If you choose not to accept him, if you choose not to allow him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, and you're just saying, I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need God. He's not going to impose his life on you. He's going to be merciful. He's going to be patient with you. He may even shed some tears over you. He may send a guy like me in your face and a couple of Nancys and a couple of Shirley's and a couple of Pat's and a couple of Mario and a couple of different evangelists in our church that will just not shut up about his love and his grace. He may do that not to bother you, but for you to find him and accept and be ready to make peace with God. It's not for you to prosper in this world and have a, a comfortable life in this world. It's to prepare you for eternity. Amen. 
But the Bible talks about another judgment, and that is called the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment is actually for believers. And that's a judgment all of us are going to go through, even pastors. In fact, I think pastors will go first. Pray for me, please. So I'd be ready. Elders, singers, cell group leaders, teachers, Christians, believers, everyone will go through that judgment. Now, our salvation will not be put into question in that. It won't be a judgment about salvation, so you don't have to worry about that. Because the Bible says in Christ there is no condemnation. No condemnation to those who are in Christ. Your judgment that you deserve has already been paid by Jesus. That is why you will not appear before the great white throne judgment. Because you have accepted the only way to be redeemed, to be saved, and to be forgiven. And that is by accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's not your good works. We talked about this for the last few weeks, but it's only because of his good works that you will inherit everlasting life in heaven because of his sacrifice. But this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, is one for us to be judged of a works. We will be judged and given account on everything we've done in this life or didn't do in this life. And it has a lot to do with our works. Romans 14, verse 10. And this is for everyone. doesn't matter what your title is. Verse uh, 10 of Romans 14, it says, you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you. 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 You then. Why do you judge your brother or sister? <laughs> that was a trap. You're like, oh my goodness. Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Do you know who's writing this? Paul. And he's including himself in there. We will all stand, including himself, the Apostle Paul. We will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This judgment appears to be a judgment of what we did with our lives and how we serve God, how we use what God invested into our life. Another verse on this, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due. Us, for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. So this talks about rewards. This talks about promotion. This talks about a time where we will receive what is due. The Bible says there's going to be something due, something given. And so look at it this way. It's kind of like we're going to get to heaven, to that judgment seat, and our bank account in heaven is going to be revealed. How much do you have in the bank? Some of us are going to have a lot of money in the bank. Because you're, way, you're, you use, you're spending the days of your life to serve God in the capacity and in the calling he has placed on your life. You're just simply doing faithfully what he's asked you to do. And you know what that is. Some of you, many of you know what your calling are. You know what your giftings are. And the Bible says that he will give, he will give an account and will receive what is due for us, whether while we were in the body, whether good or bad. There's another verse that Jesus said, to be rich for God. In other words, make sure your bank account in heaven is full. You may be rich for yourself here in this world. You may have got a lot of portfolios and things are going well financially and there's nothing wrong with that. But are you, are you bankrupt in heaven? Start getting rich for God. Start serving God with the gifts, things you've received. Start being the arm or the feet and start being the encourager or the servant in one way or another. Start doing what God wired you to do. 
for his glory and for the mission of making sure that everybody hears about Jesus and everybody get an opportunity to follow him, make disciples of all nations. You will never lose when you put your investment, your time, your energy, your resource, your gifting in the kingdom of God because it comes back. And it doesn't come back the same way you gave it. It comes back with a lot of interest. Amen? So I know I took a long detour to get here, but I wanted us to see that serving God, which is often at the last of our priorities, should be first because it's part of our worship. It's part of saying thank you to Jesus for what he has done with our lives. Amen. Can we stand together? One last way to say thank you. One last way to, to show that we're thankful to Jesus is by stopping. What do we stop doing? We stop comparing. We stop complaining. We stop grumbling about what we don't have. I see someone sing beautifully. I shouldn't be complaining, man, I don't have a voice like that. I should be thanking the Lord that I don't have a voice like that. Because I'd be singing and leading worship today. <laughs> we need to stop complaining, stop grumbling, stop comparing, and start thanking God for what He's already done in our life. God for how He's leading us and how He's working on us. And your calling will be unique to your calling, it will be different. And I need to appreciate that. And say, you know what you're doing. My life, my past, my present, and my future are in my loving Father's hands. He will not drop me. He will not forget me. He will not make a mistake with me or my future. But I put my confidence and my trust in Him. And I know some of you, you're brand new at this. And this is going to be probably challenging for you to trust somebody that you're just getting to know. But I encourage you to try to do it. And he's, he's going to earn your trust. He's going to build your faith and show you that he's there. If you trust him, if you make the first move, if you give your life to him, he will show you how he will take care of you. He will show you how. And if you decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, give my time for his kingdom. You know, maybe God's putting something in your heart. And you know, you, whatever it is, maybe it's inside the church or maybe it's outside the church. And you feel like God is asking you to do something for him and you do it, He's going to show you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to meet you. He says, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Let's pray. We're going to pray in, in, in a moment. At the end, I'm going to give an invitation to someone because... We want to do this more often, practically every Sunday. I'd love to give an opportunity. And we talked about Jesus wanting as many people saved as possible. He died for all the world. He so loved the world. And we want to give you an invitation. So if you invite a friend that doesn't know the Lord and it's not a church person, we're going to make sure we give them an opportunity to get right with God and give a, an opportunity to make peace with God and receive His forgiveness. And we're going to do that right after the service. But I want to pray for you, brother or sister. maybe there's one of those five areas that God spoke to you. You say, I'm not saying it to him enough. And, and, and I, I, I'm saying things that are not working. I'm saying things that are problematic. I'm saying the errors of this world a lot, but I'm not using my mouth to thank God enough. And I want, I want to start feeling, I want to discipline myself. I want to purposely, uh, pur purposely and intentionally fill my mouth with praise. I want to say thank you to Jesus. I want to discipline myself. Instead of saying only requests to God, I want to start by thanking Him. And right now, there's two things we could do here as a church. We can close it. We could say it. Go ahead. Just take a moment. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that I have life today. Thank you that I have health today. Thank you for your amazing and awesome salvation, Lord. 
thank you for family. And if you're not married and you don't have children, well, thank you for who you have in store for me. When the time is right, when you choose that it's the due time, start thanking God right now for the job that you have. Start thanking God that you got a roof to sleep. Start thanking God that you live in this country, a good country. Start thanking God for your friendships and for the opportunity that we have. There's a lot of people that can't even meet on a Sunday. Thank God for the freedom that we have to worship God together. Others, you're like, I I need to start praising God, singing to Him. Start saying, you know, the Bible doesn't make a big deal of us making sure that we follow some kind of songs or a template. The Bible actually says, sing to him a new song. So that song could be from you. That song could be you making the song. I've got a, a little girl that came yesterday and she made a new song. And she was so excited to show me a new song that she made to the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Just sing. And it doesn't have to make a lot of sense publicly. But to God, it's harmony. It's a beautiful song. It's coming from a heart of gratefulness. You're singing because you're happy about Jesus. You're not necessarily singing because all your circumstances are all together and you got everything, all your goals met. You're actually singing just because of His presence and His goodness. And that's what the Bible calls us to rejoice in the Lord. Because our circumstances are always going to change, no matter how close you are with God. We're going to have ups and we're going to have downs. We're going to have storms. So we need to learn to rejoice in the Lord because when we rejoice in someone that does not change, we will be constant. We will worship in good times and we will worship in bad times. We will praise in our valleys but also praise in our mountains. Amen. So, Lord, help us. Your word says you're seeking. The Father is seeking worshipers who will worship you in spirit and in truth. May you find these worshipers at New Beginning Church, Rockland and Ambro. May you find it in this community of believers, Lord. Help us, Lord. Every time we're about to grumble, every time we're about to complain about what we we don't have, remind us to replace it with gratitude and to start thanking you for what we do have and how you've already blessed us and how you're going to bless us. Now, as we're concluded, I, I want to give an opportunity maybe to one, whether you're online or you're here today, or a few who say, you know what, I, I, I want to be, we talked about a book of life, we talked about two judgments, and you don't know what judgment you would fall. You don't know if you would come face to face with the great white throne, uh, red throne judgment. And today you want to make sure that you're at peace with God. And I want to give you an opportunity today. That gift is available for you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your background is. And I want to give you an opportunity to get right with God. And that's simply by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your heart today, right now, before you walk out of this place. And then the Bible says, when you do that, you're actually going to become a child of God. Well, I'm not, I'm not asking you to sign up to a denomination. I'm not asking you to change religion. I'm not asking you to be part of this church. I'm asking you to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first step. I'm asking you to start calling on his name and receiving him as your Lord and Savior. If you're, if you're here, as every eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to just slip up a hand right now. Say, that's me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Four of you. We're going to pray for you in just a moment. Anybody else? Say, I want to receive Christ. I want to start that new beginning with Jesus. The grace of Jesus Christ is available for everyone here in this place. He paid the penalty for us. So all we got to do is just start by receiving it. Receiving his unmerited favor. His gift of love. For all of you who lifted up your hands, I want to guide you in a prayer. The rest of you, to encourage them, would you mind joining them in prayer? And if you're doing that prayer from home, go ahead, repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize today that I have sinned and fell short of your standard, of your glory. 
Today, I confess my sins to you. Would you forgive me of everything I've done? Would you wash me? I'm like that leper, le lepers, those lepers. Come and cleanse me inside out and make me a new person in Christ. I receive your gift of eternal life, but I also receive you in my life as my Lord and as my Savior. I choose to walk away from those things that are not in accordance to your will. Help me to repent. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Lord, we pray for those people who made that decision today. May you surround them. May you protect them. And may you guide them. May you help them develop an appetite for the Word of God just like a newborn baby uh, craves his milk. I pray that they would start craving the Word of God. Lord, they would devour that New Testament like a baby devours that milk. And I thank you for what you're going to do in their life. I thank you for many, 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 many more people who will find Christ in these next few days, in these next few weeks, in these next few months, in these next few years, as long as you allow us on this earth. Let New Beginning Church continue to be a light in this community for the salvation of Christ to be shared, to be preached, to be uh, communicated in all kinds of ways because we thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our life. And it's such a great gift that we want to share it with others. Use the church in Jesus' name. And everyone say, come on, let's put our hands together and applaud what God is still doing. He's still doing. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. If you made that decision, I encourage you to grab a, a New Testament and start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Reread it a bunch of times. Get familiar with the words of Jesus and the New Testament. You have any questions as a church, we're here for you. Tell somebody on your way out that you made a decision for Christ. Amen? Have some fun. Enjoy Thanksgiving with your family. God bless you.